Trinidad and Tobago, twin Caribbean islands that are the gateway to the South American continent. Beneath this business center of the Caribbean and tourist paradise exterior, stories from long ago survived through oral traditions passed down from generation to generation. Some became legends and myths, while others were forgotten completely, but some still affect the living today. Tales of black magic, the Sukuya, Dwen, Laja Bless, and other mysterious occurrences remain largely hidden to the outside world. But sometimes in the rural areas and even the cities underground, there are people who remain convinced of the existence of these strange phenomena. But where does this strong belief come from? Perhaps the answer lies in understanding the world of their ancestors. Christopher Columbus stumbled on Trinidad in 1498 and he found an island which was um, well, fairly sparsely populated by Amerindian peoples. It seems that Trinidad had been settled both by Caravan speaking and by Arawakan speaking Indians, both of which had come originally from the Venezuela area, the huge area between the Orinoco and the Amazon rivers. But for about a hundred years after Columbus came here, Trinidad really was not colonized or settled by the Spaniards. It was more or less left to its own devices, although there was some slave trading. It wasn't until 1592 that permanent Spanish settlement began with the formal founding of the city of St. Joseph. So for the next 200 years, from 1592, um, Trinidad was formally settled by the Spaniards, but it was an extremely unimportant colony in the context of the vast Spanish-American empire. At no point was the Spanish population more than about 200. There would have been a larger population, maybe in three, 400, of mestizo people. The folklore world that existed in this time, the stories that have emerged or disappeared, may have been of a Spanish and Amerindian interaction. It wouldn't be until decades later that a new culture would appear in Trinidad, impacting on its folklore. People who brought things like the Sukri and, and the Ligahu and the La Jabless, for instance, La Jabless, uh, are the people who came with, I would say, Rome de Saint Laurent, around 1785, you had a lot of French planters and their slaves. Starting in the 1770s, but really picking up in the 1780s and 1790s, you get an influx of people from the French Caribbean and from France to a lesser extent. These were mostly French slave owners, white and some of them mixed race, who were coming from places like Martinique, Guadeloupe, Grenada, Guyane, and once the revolution in Haiti began, some people came from Haiti. And they were the people who really established the plantation economy, who introduced sugar and made Trinidad into quite a thriving plantation, slave-based economy. It was the introduction of the cedula of population granted by the Spanish that allowed the fleeing French Republicans to migrate and settle in Trinidad. Carnival, for example, Carnival is a case in point which was brought to Trinidad by these very people, the French. And the real origin of that must have been in Europe as well as in Africa. So you get things like the Moko Jambi, which is um, African, and you get things like the Piro, which is European. In the middle of all this, another element was introduced when Trinidad was conquered by Britain in the course of the Revolutionary War, 1797, and Britain kept Trinidad. It was formally ceded to Britain in 1802. So you had an English element, now with formal English colonialism. English became the official language and the laws, modes of colonial government became English. So by the time slavery was ended in the 1830s, you already had a very diverse and very cosmopolitan population with a dwindling Amerindian population, a much larger African population, a mixed race population, French slave owners and landowners, and English landowners, officials, etc. 